Welcome to For the Long Run, the podcast exploring the why behind what keeps runners running long, strong, and motivated. I'm your host, Jonathan Levitt. I've been running for a few years now and have the privilege of meeting many incredible runners on my travels all across the country. This podcast is intended to share those amazing conversations. This week's podcast is with Kellen Taylor. Kellen is a mom, wife, and pro runner for Hoka One One Northern Arizona Elite in Flagstaff, Arizona. Kellen talked about being all in on what she's choosing to do, taking chances and coming up short sometimes, and the importance of a long-term focus versus short-term wins. We talked about social media and her use of it as a professional athlete. We also talked about her big scary goals, as this episode was recorded before she ran New York City Marathon, and the Olympic Marathon trials are just on the horizon as well. We talked about some of her pursuits outside of running and much more. I hope you enjoy. Welcome back. I am here in Flagstaff with Kellen Taylor. Kellen, thanks for joining today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Of course. Um, so let's uh, let's start off with with a question uh, here. Who is Kellen Taylor? Um, <laughs> Kellen Taylor is a, a mom, a wife, um, a professional runner for Northern Arizona Elite, um, running for Hoka One One, and yeah, just kind of out here in Flagstaff, kind of living the dream, I guess. Nice. So it's a beautiful day here in Flagstaff, a little windy, um, but the vibe I get out here is that it's just, it's amazing and it's fun to train and it's fun to, you know, be a part of this community. So what, what brought you out here originally? When I first graduated college, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. I think like most people, when they graduate college, you know, you're just kind of thrown out into the, into the wild and, you know, have to kind of, uh, sink or swim. Right. And I decided that I wanted to run professionally, at least give it a go while I still could. Um, you know, it's such a short lived career, um, in a lot of cases that if you have the opportunity, then you might as well take it. Um, so that's kind of what I decided to do. You know, I got on Google and Googled a bunch of different teams, um, just kind of trying to get a vibe for what was out there. Um, cause I was pretty naive, you know, yeah. I didn't really know a whole lot about post collegiate running. Um, and I happened to follow upon McMillan elite and that was the team that was out here. The only know, team several, out here, right? Yeah. Several years ago and contacted them and, you know, just kind of went from there. Um, but you know, I, I came out, I visited, uh, we decided that it was a good fit and I had planned to move out here in December of 2009, I believe. And I found out I was pregnant. So I did not get to make that move right away, but I did ask them if they would maybe hold my spot Mm -hmm. and they were, yeah, McMillan. Um, yeah, Greg McMillan. And he was really nice and he was like, yeah, that's absolutely fine. Um, you know, just let us know when you're ready. So nine, well, let's see, 2011, March, 2011, we moved out here and been out here ever since, um, you know, joined Ben Rosario's group in 2014, I believe. And Got signed with Hoka in 2015, and you know it's just kind of been an upward trajectory. Cool, yeah. I've spoken with a lot of um, a lot of your teammates on the team, and including um, Coach Ben. And it's fun to see the the enthusiasm and realness that you guys bring to um, bring to the sport. And I think it's it's setting the trend for a lot of other teams and individuals um, by really showing that you know it's not a highlight reel. But sometimes it is, and that's okay too. Um, so, has has it always been your nature to be super open with with sharing the you know the highs and lows, or was that sort of um, part of the culture with with the team here? For me, no. Um, you know, I'm kind of a person where. If I didn't have to have social media, I wouldn't. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's, it's part of the job. I mean, that is the culture of our team. That is, um, kind of our, our mission statement, if you will. And I'm happy to be a part of that and kind of share things. Um, you know, I'm not going to tell you everything that I'm doing every second of every right. day because that's just not me. I want to still be genuine in what I'm, uh, putting out there, but I absolutely will share, you know, some key workouts that we do and, you know, like, if I had a bad one, right. um, because that's, that's just life. Everybody has that. Right. Um, you know, we're not superhuman. We are fast, but we're not superhuman. We all have bad days, bad races, bad workouts. We get sick. Um, you know, and I think that people really like to see that because they sometimes forget that that happens just to humans us too. too. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think it's super cool. Um, and the other piece is when it goes well, it's it's a shared success. And it's not, you know, you're not doing all this work in private and then, you know, you're an overnight success. It's um, it's very much a shared, you know, a shared high. Right. Everybody kind of get knows, like they know if you're prepped for a really right. good one because they've seen the workouts that you've done um, and, you know, are like, yeah, you're definitely ready. And sometimes, you know, it doesn't work out and you don't hit that day. But then when it does, you know, you kind of get that collective uh, congratulations from the masses and, you know, everybody's happy for you. And that's it's nice to have that support. And then also to be able to show them that, yeah, if you work hard, you might have some failures. But if you keep working, it will come around and, you know, hopefully you'll hit that day where it's really special. Definitely. And I think that's a piece that a lot of amateurs miss that like they want to do something now and they want to do it this year. Um, I had a conversation with Peter Bromka on the podcast and he said, people come to me all the time. Like I want to be Q this year. Um, and he said, how about in three years or how about in five years? Or let's make that part of your long-term plan. And personally, I came off of a pretty good, uh, 5k in 2014. And I said, okay, that I'm pretty fit. I'd like to run a BQ next year. Uh, that was 2014 and I didn't run until 2019. And so I think, I think seeing the the long term approach that that a lot of pro athletes take is super helpful for um, for many of the people that are listening to this podcast for sure. Right. I mean, it's not it's not a sport where it's an instant success. Right. I mean, I think that you have those anomalies where they do step up and they are, you know, they're hitting every goal that they set for themselves. Right. But maybe then they're not setting goals that are hard enough. Exactly. You know, there's there's a, uh, I mean it's good to have goals that are hard to reach and you have to work for. And maybe it takes a week, maybe it takes a year, maybe it takes five years, you know? Um, so you had a real big smile when you talked about big, big goals and setting big goals. Um, so what, what, what is exciting? What is keeping you excited for 2020 and beyond? I mean, obviously the Olympics, <laughs> right. um, you know, that's the highlight of the year. Um, but you know, I've always been somebody that sets really big goals and I think at times, you know, maybe people think that they're kind of laughable. Um, but you know, that's fine. You can laugh right. at it, but you know, give me five years, give me whatever time I need in order to do it or get close to doing it. Um, and you know, we'll see what happens, but you know, 2020 is coming around and, We've got a phenomenal women's marathon field that I I feel like it's going to be one of the hardest teams to make. But, you know, that makes it exciting, right. um, you know, going in and knowing that you have to be at the best to earn that spot um, on that day. So that's really exciting. That's awesome. Um, what will it be like coming from a, a city like Flagstaff where you might recognize, you know, a dozen people on the line because they're your neighbors? Mm hmm. I mean, that's nice. You know, it's nice to have some familiarity where you're out there racing. Um, you know, we're not necessarily all training together, right? but you know, we'll see each other on the trails and wave, or maybe we have, you know, like Sarah Hall might jump mm -hmm. into one of our workouts every once in a while, uh, which is nice. You know, it just, we're all out there trying to make the team. So going against one another, right. but there is still kind of a cohesive bond between all of us just because of, you know, where we live, who we're surrounded by. Um, so it's special, you know, like if one of us doesn't make the team and another does, then you can be happy for right. them, which is special. Cool. Um, so when we first started, you talked about a whole bunch of different hats that you wear. Um, one of the topics that I like to discuss on the podcast is balance or lack of. Um, so what, what's your, what's your take on sort of juggling all those different hats and how do you do it? I mean, I think that <laughs> that's the million dollar question. Um, you know, it, it is hard to balance a lot of things when you have them all on your plate. Um, I think you kind of have to decide, prioritize. That's the biggest thing, you know, what's most important at this moment, um, 
Is it your running on this specific day at this specific time? Or is it going to your kid's soccer game? Yeah. Or can should you run first and then go and catch the end of a soccer game? Um, you know, it's just kind of trying to figure out what is most important. And I try to kind of keep those things separate. So when I'm at practice, I'm there and I'm all in and I'm doing what I need to do. But the second that I'm done with my workout, I'm out of there. Yeah. Like I'm not sticking around. I'm probably not going to sit and chat or go to brunch. Um a lot of people do. That's just not me just because right. I have other things that I'm going to do. And I, you know, I want to catch the end of a soccer game that they're maybe losing like 10 to zero. <laughs> um, Did that happen recently? It didn't, it actually didn't happen recently, but it's <laughs> happened a lot of times. Yeah. Um, you know, but I want to be involved in everything and not feel like I have to um, miss things for one thing or another. Um, so, yeah, I mean, just prioritizing. Yeah, it's an interesting um it's an interesting response and and it's sort of in line with what a lot of people have shared. It's it's not trying to do everything, it's trying to do the things that are most important. Um so I had a conversation with Magda Boulay and her answer was basically I'm not balanced and I go all in on the stuff that that matters most and if I can come home and go to go to bed at the end of the day and I know my my son is happy and my husband is happy and, you know, my dog is happy and, you know, those are the things that matter most to her. That's, that's balance for her. So it's, I think a lot of people struggle with trying to do everything and trying to do everything well or okay. And I think that skewing more towards like picking your spots um, versus doing it all is is definitely you know can definitely be a good approach right and i certainly don't have it all figured out but <laughs> you know i think that i definitely have many times like even just yesterday i was like oh ben i have so much going on i don't know i don't know what to do like i'm in my taper right now yeah. in the new york city marathon and i just feel like i'm running around constantly um but you know, so you what, figure it out so what does a coach like ben do when when you're feeling run down or you're feeling tired um, well today, I mean, I have, a, I have a cold that I picked up a couple of days ago and kind of went in, I had a workout this morning and I went into it and I was like, Ben, I don't know. I don't know about these paces today. I think I'm just going to, I don't know. What do you think if we just, you know, I don't know, cut it back a little bit or just not press. And he was like, yeah, that's fine. I mean, we'll just see what happens and see how it goes. So, you know, he's understanding when it's not something that is, super detrimental to your training. Like, you know, if I would, if today, if I would have went out and hit my paces exactly how they are prescribed on paper, I could have maybe put myself into a hole. Yeah. Um, so I went out and I ran, you know, probably a few seconds slower than I was supposed to. And it was fine. It was still good work. It wasn't like that, you know, the bulk of my segment, it was just icing. Right. Um, yeah, I think that a lot of people, amateurs and pros included look at, um, look at training in different ways. And I think that looking at it under the lens of like, it's a brick. Every run is a brick in a wall or in a house versus like, if I don't hit this workout, everything goes crashing down. Um, You can miss a brick or you can miss a, you know, a stone in the wall. I think that's important for, for people to hear that, you know, someone at your level is, is making those intelligent decisions um, to not put yourself in that hole. So thanks for sharing that. Um, so the, the point of the podcast or the goal of this podcast is exploring the why behind what keeps runners running long, strong, and motivated. So it's a focus on the mental side of sports. So I'm always fascinated with like, where, where does your mind go at mile 20 or at mile 23, you're turning onto fifth Avenue or you're, you know, crossing the first bridge and you know, it's, you're going uphill and things are getting difficult. Where what do you what do you draw on when things are getting difficult? When it gets hard for me in a race, I, I mean, usually most race, no race is ever the same um, from a mental standpoint. I think different things at different points every single race. Um, drawing back to like New York, though, that I did in 2017, um, you know, the thought was you did a crud ton of training. Yeah. To be here, you know, like you're not just going to, you know, don't waste it. Yeah. yeah. Why would you, you're going to keep pushing. I don't care how much you hurt. Yep. I don't care if you're going a little bit slower than you're supposed to. I don't care if the patch is deep or pack is detached from you. You just keep running, keep putting one foot in front of the other. Um, 
in my case, I feel like most marathons, everything kind of comes full circle. Not all the time, yeah. but most of the time where you be- will have like a good patch. You start out, you're like, yeah, this is so easy and right. fun. And then you get, I don't know, hopefully 15, 20 miles in. You're like, oh, this sucks. <laughs> this is really hard. But then you just keep moving and, you know, it comes back around to where you're like, okay, I feel all right. I feel all right. And then you're 24 miles in and you've only got two miles left and, you know, anybody can do two miles. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think it's just kind of putting it in perspective while you're hurting immensely, um, which is kind of hard to do. But just remembering why you're out there, what you're doing, thankful for being out there. Um when I ran New York in 2017, the constant thought that I had in my head was, you know, just be thankful for this opportunity. Like not everybody gets to do this, you know, especially at my level. Right. Um, so, you know, th- that's something that really helps push you along because a lot of people aren't so lucky. Definitely. So why'd you go for your first run? My first run? Yeah. Ever? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't even know when I went for my first run. Or second or third or fifth. Yeah, honestly, I don't even know. Um, Well, I joined cross middle school cross country in sixth grade, I believe. And I honestly joined just because I was good at running. Yeah. Um, So drawing from those, those early memories, it was more so just from the competitive standpoint of going out and being able to win um, because it's fun to win. Everybody loves to win. And especially if you're an 11 year old kid, um, beating everyone else around you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So some of the boys, you know, it was really fun. Um, but I honestly didn't really love this sport until I was in college, even post collegiately. Um, if you would ask me in high school, I would have probably given you the craziest look ever. Like, no, there's not a chance in heck that I would going to run past when I need to run. Right. You know, I wouldn't run the, the two mile trial at in middle school. Yeah. Yeah. Not a chance. I wouldn't run on break. I wouldn't run, you know, anytime that it wasn't prescribed, I was not out there. Yeah. Um, but so know, what, what changed? You know, I think when I decided to move out here, um, you know, I had a daughter and this was my job. So for me, it was more so about, being all in and what I'm choosing to do. Um, so, you know, I, I wanted to be able to provide for my family and this isn't a job where you necessarily can do that easily. So going to each race with intent of, you know, putting everything in that I, that I can to come out of it at least, uh, on top a little bit from a money standpoint. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily the best reason to run for the money because it's not necessarily always good, but that was a big motivator for me when I was, when I was younger and first starting out post collegiately. So what keeps you doing it? Um, now it's just to see how good I can be. Um, you know, that's always been something, another reason as to why I do it. Um, I'm a a super competitive person. Uh, I don't like to lose at anything. Um, but you know, I still have that thought in the back of my head, like you're not done yet. You you can still run faster. Um, you can get better, and I think that I'll probably keep running until that thought in my head is like you're good, you're done. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it's kind of just to see how good I can be now. How How will you know when that time has come? You know, I don't know if I ever will. Yeah. Um, You'll be winning the 85 year old age groups. <laughs> I mean, yeah, there's people out there doing it. So um, it wouldn't surprise me if I was one of those people. But, you know, I have I have other things that I want to do past running. Um, so I think for me, it'll be an easier, uh, it'll be easier for me to walk away than maybe some other athletes. Um, just because I do have another career that's kind of like on hold right now um, to p- pursue this. So, you know, hopefully can find i'll figure it out yeah well let's talk about that other career it's definitely a super important one yeah firefighting yes um yeah um i decided when i was 27 um you know a little bit late there uh that that was what i wanted to do like as an actual career and kind of went to school and got everything done that i needed to get done in regards to like being prepared to step into the role and now i'm kind of just in the the hold phase which yeah. is is not really a fun place to be but i'm kind of at peace with it at the moment so what does preparation for that look like um for for getting all your credentials and and everything like that um the route that i took was going to the junior college here and just getting my associates in fire science i wasn't really in a hurry to necessarily jump into the role so it was kind of just you know taking a few classes here and there while i was still running and not feeling like i was being um completely bogged down by it 
So doing that, um, getting my firefighter one and two certification, getting my EMT certification, um, hazmat, you know, just a a few, a few things. So what, what was, what interested you about that? I think the challenge of it. Yeah. Um, like I said, I'm super competitive. So, you know, a female inside of a traditionally male's role is, you know, a pretty competitive, competitive thing to do. You know, it's not, it's not standard. And I went to, uh, like our live fire burn class and, you know, wanted to prove that I could do everything that the guys could do. So, you know, they're hauling, you know, a a dummy and I'm like, okay, I'm going to haul the dummy too. Yeah. So, you know, just kind of proving that I can do it as well. And then the, just the constant, um, change of the job is also interesting. I don't want to be a person that's sitting at a desk every day for 10 hours a day. Um, you know, that's not something that I would enjoy. And that's one of my goals in life is to never have a job that I don't love. And, you know, I'm 33 and so far so good. So I'm hoping to (laughs) doing it right to to continue that. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, what are you scared of? Um, that's a good question. (laughs) Um, I dislike snakes. I'm not scared of them, though. <laughs> are there a lot of snakes um, in Flagstaff? Um, there's a lot by my house, or a fair amount. The most I've ever seen are by my house. Um, I dislike them, but I am not scared of them. But I would say failure. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just I feel like I'm doing this sport to try and hit my goals, um, and my goal is to ultimately make an Olympic team, and. I feel like I could walk away from the sport feeling successful if I did that. And if I did not do that, I don't think I would feel successful. I mean, I could be proud of the things yeah. that I'd done, but I don't but, think I would feel successful. But why Why not? I don't know. It's just hardwired into my brain. Yeah. I can't, you know. But that's just, the, just that's the ultimate those, level? It's just one of those things. Yeah. So it's it's the the chance to represent the country. It's a chance to, to do that. And that's that's the driving force for, you know, the ins and outs and the and the day-to-day work that that you're putting in yeah absolutely so that's the north star yeah yeah i think it's helpful to have that um sort of guiding principle or guiding light that you know you don't want to do the core work you don't want to do the you know the double or something like that um i think that again getting back to talking about amateurs like a lot of amateurs skip from goal to goal and it's like oh i want to run this here and i want to run that here and it's a, it's sort of a tough thing to do because the best, like I didn't race a marathon for two years and when I was ready to race, I was ready to race sure. and, and I PR, I had a massive PR and it it's, it's just, but like, and then the next day it was just the next day and it wasn't, it didn't change me one way or another that, you know, I finally broke three right. and, and I think that something like a, making an Olympic team is like such a, an aspiration and so high that like you can work at that for 15 years. Right. And that and can be the North Star it. and still not hit it. Yeah. But, but you can still be successful, I think, without hitting it. Oh, absolutely. And that's why I said I could still be yeah. proud of what I had done. Right. Um, but I think in my brain that, yeah, I would still count it as kind of a failure in that sense. Um, you know, and I know a lot of people that are like, you know, it doesn't matter if I have never make an, if I never make an Olympic team, yeah. yada, yada. That's just not me. Yeah. So. so you've got New York coming up. You've got Atlanta a couple months after that. What will the, what will the turnaround look like in between those two uh, races? I'm going to have a good November. Um, I'm going to have a fun November. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because after November, we're kind of hunkering down and getting back to business. Um, when you run marathons, you know, you're kind of in a you have two, pretty much two cycles a year and two weeks, maybe a month. I mean, a few months and maybe a month in between those cycles, yeah. like where you start another build up again, um, whether it's just base mileage or whatever, but there just really isn't that much downtime. Right. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to have fun in November. Spend You're a traveling. lot of time with, yeah, hopefully spend a lot of time with my family. Um, yeah, and then just get get ready for the big show because you know that's kind of what it what it's all about. Every four years, you know. So, what will you be thinking about on the start line in February? Making the team. Yeah, that's <laughs> just one track. 
I mean, making the, I mean, that really, that's why I'm there. Yeah. You know, I'm not there to, I don't know, just have a good time. Yeah. You know, hopefully it is a good Execute. time and you have fun. Yeah. Um, but the best way to have fun is by running well yeah. and doing what you set out to do. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm all business there. Cool. So two very different races. How, how tactically, how do you approach, um, a race that's more of a time trial versus a race that's a race? Um, I mean, a time trial, I think, is much easier than a race race just yeah. because, you know, you have a watch. Look at it. Um, I'm not necessarily great at that, but you know what you're supposed to run. If it's a flat course, you should be able to run a pretty even cadence throughout the whole thing. Um, and if you're not worrying about where you're placing, then it's just kind of you against the clock. Right. Um, which do you prefer? I like, I like to run fast and win. So, nice. both. <laughs> so, so tactically, how are you breaking up a marathon like that? Um, I try when I ran grandma's the way that I broke it up and it seemed to work really well was I thought of it as a workout. Mm -hmm. Um, so we got, I don't know, half marathon in, and I was like, okay, so you, you have 13 miles left on Lake Mary. You're like, visualizing yeah. where I'm at on Lake Mary during a long steady state. And I don't know, it just made it, it made it feel easier. Yeah. Um, and then just counting down those miles. And then it was like, Oh, you're six, you have six miles left of your steady state. Um, and then, you know, you get within a couple miles and then it's just go. But so is visualization a big part of your mental prep? No, <laughs> no, it's not. Um, I'm a pretty laid back runner. I don't, I don't do a lot of, I call them weird. I don't know. I don't think they're really that weird, but I don't do a lot of those things. Um, I don't know. I think, I think you do the training, then you're yeah. ready. Um, so it's just, com you have a lot of confidence. Yeah. I That's mean, awesome. It doesn't always work out, but, <laughs> but yeah. It gets you to the line. Yeah. And it gets you off the line. Right. Um, what do you wish your fans knew about you? Um, <laughs> ooh, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I guess, I guess this is, this might be a big one. Um, I'm not as mean as I look. <laughs> um, <laughs> I kind of think I kind of have like a, a constant skull. But that's just, that's well, just it's my, business time. It's just my face. I don't know what else to tell you guys. Um, I am a pretty awkward person, but that's just, that's just me. That's too. runners in general. That's just me. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm friendly. I'll talk to you if you talk to me. <laughs> um, so you're wearing a burrito mafia shirt. Um, does Scott really eat burritos every day? You know, I don't live with him, but it seems like he's pretty dedicated to it. Um, I had a burrito bowl about an hour ago, which he's very against. Um, but I'm kind of like, that's still a burrito, Scott. Yeah. So it's an unwrapped burrito. Sure. I mean, but it's still a burrito. It's still a burrito. It's got the yeah. content. Yep. So it's in, it's even in the name. Yep. Um, so what is your go to post long run uh, recovery meal? Um, that's a Besides good one. burrito bowls. <laughs> um, let's see. I don't know if I have a go-to um, in regards to meals. Um, sometimes it depends how I feel after the run. Sometimes I don't feel very good. Yeah. Um, so I actually won't eat, which is bad, terrible. Don't take that advice. It's not advice. Don't do, <laughs> do it. Do as I say, not as yeah, I do. <laughs> don't do it. Um, but drinks, I have uh, the strawberry lemonade that I really, really like. It's super refreshing, really good. Um, that's one of my go-tos. Um, other than that though, nothing really. Um, another question that I get a lot is the, um, like combining parenting with, um, training. How are you? We talked a little bit about it. How are you? Um, how do you do that? Um, scheduling yeah um you know it, get, it gets a little bit tricky here in my case just because we foster kids so we kind of we will have kids randomly come in yeah. you know and kind of disrupt our schedule i guess if you'll say um but you know it's just kind of figuring out a new normal um we got a seven a seven month old on friday and you know just yesterday my husband and i were like oh we need to get on a schedule because <laughs> we're just a mess right now um 
but you know, you figure it out. I think it's just like anything. Um, if you want it to work, you'll make it work. You'll figure it out. Um, it's not always going to be easy. It's not always going to be perfect, but okay is sometimes good enough. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of, that's kind of what we do. I mean, if you can find a schedule, great. Um, if not, just make sure everybody's fed and clothed and, you know, getting where they need to be when they need to be. Makes sense. Nail the basics. Um, what is it like living in a town like Flagstaff where, you know, anywhere you look, there are Olympians and sub four milers and, you know, women that are under 220 and men that are under 210 and stuff like that. Um, what's, what's it like being in a city like that where every, not everyone, but like there are so many people at your level. Yeah, it's cra- it's crazy. I I often think like how funny it is because you know, we'll have like w- world champions, Olympic yeah. gold medalists here in town and they'll be like at the grocery store or something and I'm like these people don't even know. It's so silly. Like <laughs> you're standing next to like one of the greatest athletes in the world, yeah. but you would never know. Um but that's just flag stuff, you know. I mean, I think the the culture of flag stuff is really special. Um you know, the, the people that are here are, you know, they're kind of all in, in whatever, whatever level that it is that they're at, um, you know, from the community runners to the professional runners, um, we're kind of all one big group. Um, we're not necessarily doing workouts together, right. but we know, of, the we know of and, each other yeah. and, you know, we'll wave to each other or meet at a community event. Um, so it's really, it's really special. Um, I think that you'd be hard pressed to find another community like this. Cool. So you're up at 7,000 feet. There are obviously some additional challenges that that presents. Uh, I laugh every time I think about the conversation I had with Ben Bruce a few months ago where we were meeting at the bottom of the track at Northern Arizona and we walked up to the top and he asked me a question, right? I, I like couldn't breathe <laughs> like <laughs> coming up from the stairs. And I asked him a question that I knew like would be more than like a 10 second answer just so I could like catch my breath. And he was like, man, I've been living here for a bunch of years and I still get that. So what are some of the things that you do to help at altitude uh, so that you can feel good? Um, I think the biggest thing with altitude is just kind of rewiring your brain. Um, I, that was the biggest thing for me. I mean, I think when you first get here, you'll have like some sleep disruption and you'll probably feel pretty crummy running. Uh, but your body does come around to both of those things after, you know, a month or two. Um, so all trips to altitude must be a month or two. Yes, this exactly. Is, this is, I'm talking directly to my boss here. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, hills will, will always suck. Like they're never easier. It doesn't yeah. matter how long you live here. It doesn't matter if you've been born, if you were born in altitude, they're always going to suck. Um, <laughs> that's one thing I always tell people. <laughs> and then, yeah, just rewiring how you think about your paces. Um, when I first moved here, I was running stuff slower than I had done in college. And I was like, oh. <laughs> this, this is terrible. What's wrong with me? And then I was like, oh yeah, altitude conversion. You kind of just have to refi- refigure how, what your times are supposed to be because that's altitude. Um, so, you know, just kind of thinking, oh yeah, it needs to be 10 to whatever your conversion is. Everybody mm-hmm. has a different one. Um, seconds slower. You're fine. I mean, it might still suck, yeah. but it'll work out a heck of a lot better than if you try and go and hit your, pace at sea level, like sea level time. Definitely. Let's talk about easy running for a second. Um, I love when pros are able to share, you know, roughly what their easy paces are. Um, is it, is pace something you pay attention to? Is it simply effort based? I kind of go by feel. Um, I don't run especially slow. Um, I usually teeter in like Anywhere from the 6.30 to 7.15 range. Um, but it just kind of depends how I feel. Yeah. And then also I'm, I'm kind of just like, I want to be done. Yeah. Like I just want, <laughs> I want, I want to be done with my run, do whatever I need to do. Um, but for comparison, so 6.30 to 7.15 pace for easy at altitude, but your marathon pace is low, like low to mid fives, right? 5.30. Yeah. So it's still a minute and up to a minute and a half slower, two minutes with the conversion. So sure. That's that's slow relative to yeah. you know marathon pace. So I right. think that's that's huge. Yeah. I mean, no, nobody's out going at least on our team going out here and 
completely hammering every yeah. run. Um, I think that I am probably one of the faster, easy run people on our team. Um, but you know, you just do what works for you. Right. And some days, you know, it's that seven fifteen, maybe even seven thirty pace. And some days it's like, I feel fine. I'm just going to get this run done, yep. you know, six thirty pace. Um, as long as your body's recovering, that's really all that matters. Cool. Uh, where can we find you on social media? Um, I am Kellen Taylor 16, I think on Twitter and Instagram. Cool. I think those are right. Well, we'll (laughs) we'll be rooting for you in New York and Atlanta. And, uh, thanks for chatting today. Yeah. Thank you. Of course. That's it for today's episode. Like many long runs, it's sad when it has to end. I hope you join in next week on for the long run. And in the meantime, happy trails. If you've enjoyed this episode, it would mean a lot to me if you shared it so that others can find it and enjoy it too.